Howdy folks, welcome to lesson 19 of my Network Plus course. In this lesson, we'll be learning about the CIA triad. Now we're going to right off the bat jump into this topic folks. So the first thing you need to know about the CIA triad is it is not to be confused with the Central Intelligence Agency in the United States of America. So unfortunately due to the abbreviation looking the same, some folks might think, oh, okay, it's that. No, it is not that. It's not to be confused with the Central Intelligence Agency. It's not the same thing, guys. So the CIA triad in IT. So I'm going to give you folks a bit of a triangle here on the right-hand side to symbolize this triad. So the CIA stands for confidentiality. That's what the C stands for. I think you guys already have a fairly good idea of what confidentiality might be. If you don't know, stay tuned. We're going to elaborate in just a moment. The I stands for integrity, you know, making sure something is original and authentic and that kind of jazz. The A stands for availability, making sure whatever resource this is, is always available to the user. In a nutshell, at least that's what that is. So there you have it, folks. That is what CIA stands for. It stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. I even gave you folks a bit of a nice little triangle there to symbolize this. Now, folks, according to CompTIA, this is what they say, this is not my words, apparently due to the confusion of this CIA and the one in America, this CIA is sometimes referred to as AIC to avoid confusion with the one in America. Now, that's what CompTIA says, that's what the manual says, but I can tell you guys now that is nonsense. I'm only telling you guys that because, well, they might ask you this in the exam, but in real life, I can tell you folks that is nonsense. Nobody in IT refers to this as AIC. Heck, a lot of people don't even talk about the CIA, quite frankly. But if they are going to be talking about it, someone in IT would normally know what you're talking about. So if you are in IT, and I am in IT, and I start mentioning the CIA triad, you're probably going to know what I'm talking about, because we're both in IT. But if we're both in IT, I can pretty much guarantee you nobody's going to be mentioning the AIC. That is not something we actually do in the field, so that is total nonsense. Total case of don't believe everything you read. Anyway, folks, so regarding the CIA, let's cover each of these three points individually. I'm going to start you folks off with confidentiality. So I'm going to move the little triangle here on the right hand side. So which one are we starting with? Confidentiality. If you guys don't know what this is, it means something is for certain people's eyes only. So this is when information is private and remains private or needs to be kept private when stored, transferred, or communicated. So, I mean, guys, this actually extends well beyond IT. So if you look at something like an envelope, for crying out loud, if I give you something in an envelope, whether this be money, whether this be some form of documentation, it doesn't give you any form of security, so it's not really integrity per se, but it does give you confidentiality. So if it's something that's for your eyes only, I suppose you could say your authorized eyes only, then only you would be able to see that. This could be a salary slip. This could be some medical documentation. You get what I'm saying? So confidentiality is to make sure only the people who this is intended for is able to, well, see it for the most part. This obviously applies to when it's being stored, when it's being transferred or communicated. That's confidentiality. Now, folks, this can be achieved in many ways. So depending on what we're talking about, what example I give you, some examples might not just give you confidentiality. Some of them might very well actually even give you integrity or possibly even availability. It all depends on what we're talking about. So if you look at something like BitLocker encryption, that's just one of many kinds of encryption you get, it gives you confidentiality because nobody's going to be able to see the contents on that hard drive. If you don't know what BitLocker is, guys, that is something we used to go and encrypt a whole freaking flash drive, external drive, or internal hard drive. So that gives you confidentiality. But at the same time, it coincidentally also gives you integrity because nobody's going to be able to get into that hard drive and um, change any of the contents. Never mind seeing the contents, they also can't change the contents. So BitLocker is an example of something that will give you both confidentiality as well as integrity. It's not going to give you availability, unfortunately, but it's an example of something that will give you more than one thing in the CIA triad. 
Not always going to be the case. There are other kinds of encryption out there that might give you, let's say, integrity, but it might not give you confidentiality, or it might give you confidentiality, but it might not give you integrity. So if confidentiality, folks, information does not get disclosed to any unauthorized people or machines. Like we said many times before, it's for certain people or certain machines' eyes only. Can't believe I'm saying certain machines' eyes, but that's where we are these days now, isn't it? Now, methods that can be used to provide you or someone or something with confidentiality, that could, of course, be encryption, like I said earlier. You get different kinds of encryption, folks. Just please note that. So BitLocker that I mentioned earlier is not the only kind of encryption you get. I mean, this can be, for example, a digital signature, and some of these will actually give you encryption. Other things you can go and use is access controls. So that could potentially be, let's say, a password of sorts. That's just one of many examples. A password is access control. So only the people that's allowed to enter this account or this device or this network, only they will be allowed to do so because they have to provide some form of identification. That is an access control. And if you don't have access, then well, you can't see the contents, obviously. And then another method I'm going to give you guys free here is stenography. I'm really hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly because I'm probably butchering it. I'm not English, like I've said in many of my videos before, so I sometimes butcher some of the names of this, but I think you guys get the idea. At least I have the spelling correct there, I think. So that is when you hide something inside of something else. I kid you not, folks. This could be something like this invisible ink that some of the kids use in schools these days. So if you've got a piece of paper or a document and you go and use invisible ink, then the average person might not be able to see that. But if you've got the right light, like a black light, then you might be able to see what has been written. Um, Stignography can also be used in pictures, in videos, and all kinds of documents. It'll appear to be one thing when there's actually something hidden inside of that image, that video, or whatnot. Really cool, isn't it? All right, folks, let's move you on to the second item in the CIA triad. That was integrity. So like I briefly mentioned in the beginning of this video, that is to make sure something is original and authentic. To make sure someone or something has not tampered with this item. This can be something like an email, for example. If I send you an email, how do you know this email is really from me? I mean, you can go and say, okay, well, I can go and look at who it's coming from. You know, I can look at the email address that it's from. Uh, well, for all you know, someone spoofed my email address. That means they forged my email address. So there's no real way for you to know that it's really from me because somebody, they could have very well have forged my email address. In other words, spoofed my email address. Or maybe the email was from me. I did send it to you, but someone or something intercepted it somewhere along the line and that email is no longer original. They might have changed the contents, added something, removed something. We don't know. Or maybe there's a third option. Maybe someone compromised my email address. They hacked into it or something. And now they're sending emails to you as if they are me. So how do we ensure something like an email is authentic and that it's original? Guys, I'm just using an email address as an example. This is obviously not just limited to emails. I mean, this could be a document for all we know. It can be a lot of things. So for integrity, we can say it is a way of ensuring that the information has not been changed by someone or something and that it's still in its original condition. It ensures that data is stored or transferred as intended. So the way you receive it is the way it was supposed to be received. Now, how do we actually ensure this? How do we know something is original and authentic when we receive it? How do we do that, guys? There's a couple of methods we can use to ensure that. One such method would be hashing. It's a form of encryption we can go and use. So I can go and use, for example, a key on my side, and you can go and use a key on your side to go and, well, decrypt this. So without the keys, it's not going to work. So if someone is going to try and intercept our communication, yeah, they'll get it, but they won't be able to view it. They won't be able to change it because, well, it's encrypted to a certain extent. You need one of the two keys. So one key will encrypt, the other key will go and decrypt it, just in case you guys were wondering. Something else that can be used is a digital signature. So very much like a piece of paper, let's say this is a contract perhaps, 
where there might be signatures on it. Maybe it's a contract between me and you, an agreement of sorts. Now, to basically ensure that one of us don't go and mess around with this contract afterwards, we are both going to sign this agreement, this contract. And then afterwards, if one of the signatures is missing or they look different, then we know one of the two parties has tried to change this agreement and it's no longer the original. Now, that same principle, folks, applies to a digital contract. So this can be a digital contract. It can be a lot of other things. You can also go and add a signature to a digital contract. This can just be a scanned digital version of your actual hand signature, or it can be an actual digital signature. Something that doesn't necessarily look like a human hand signature, by the way, in case you're wondering. So this signature of sorts, which we call a digital signature, ensures the content, the email, the document, whatever it might be, is original. So if I send you something and you see the signature is missing, that is a red flag. It means it's no longer original. Someone intercepted this or changed this. Something happened and you need to be alert. Or the signature looks different than what it's supposed to. That is also a red flag. So digital signatures is a very good way of ensuring integrity, folks. And then lastly, certificates. So if you are going on to, let's say, a website, I'm just using a website as an example. These websites and various things like websites often use what we call certificates. These are digital certificates. It's not like a certificate that you will get when you go and write an exam. These are digital certificates and they're issued by what we call CAs, which is short for Certificate Authorities very well-known certificate authorities. One such one would be GoDaddy. So if you have a very well-known website, you are going to go and get yourself a certificate issued for that website from an entity like GoDaddy. It's not limited to GoDaddy. I'm just giving you guys an example. Now, GoDaddy is going to go check out your website or whoever you decide to go and use, and they're going to see, okay, it seems legit. It doesn't seem like you're up to some sort of shenanigans, and they're going to issue your website with a certificate. Now, every time somebody tries to visit your website with, let's say, well-known browsers like Mozilla Firefox or Google Chrome, you know, those kinds of things, your browser will automatically recognize the certificate in the background. This all happens automatically in the background without most of you knowing. So when you visit the website, most websites have certificates in the background to basically prove that they are legit. Your browser will see that and it's going to recognize that. Now, if the website does not have a certificate, it tends to look suspicious. And when your browser might pop up with some sort of message and tell you, hey, listen, bro, watch out. This website is suspicious. Other times you'll find websites do have certificates, but they were not issued by a well-known certificate authority. This is especially the case with companies having their own internal websites. So if a company has their own internal website, which is only going to be used by their own internal staff, they will often go and use their own certificate authority. Now, it gets the job done. The only issue of that is when your own staff tries to visit this website, it's going to pop up with a warning message saying the certificate is not recognized. It's because your own internal certificate authority is not a very well-known one, and the browsers of people's machines, they don't recognize that. But this is normally where you would go and inform your staff, when you see this warning, just click on, yes, I accept the warning. Yes, I understand the risks and all that because we know about it. We issued a freaking certificate for crying out loud. All right, folks. And then I'm going to move you on to the last letter in the CIA triad. That would be A, which is for availability. This is to ensure something is available to you or the user, that it does not become unavailable. This could be something like a document. It could be a connection of some sort. We basically need to make sure that the users are able to access what they need to access when they need to access it. That is, in a nutshell, availability. So your systems and services must be up and running, and the information should be easily accessible to those who need it and it needs to access it. So it needs to be up and running, and it shouldn't be a mission of note to try and access it. So authorized users need to be able to access information quickly and easily. There shouldn't be a situation of, oh, shucks, the server is offline. Sorry, folks, we're going to have to wait until we get it back up and running again. No, you need to have a backup clone server. You need to have a backup internet connection, a backup network card in each of these servers, a backup this, a backup that. So it basically comes down to making sure you have high availability, redundancy, and fault tolerance. That's actually what we're saying here. Availability just comes down to high availability, redundancy, and fault tolerance when it comes to documents and resources that needs to be accessed by the user.
doubling up on everything is what we're actually saying. All right, folks, I hope you've learned something in today's lesson, being number 19. If you did, do me a favor and let me know in the comment section down below what you learned that you might not have known before. And of course, do me a favor, give this video a like. It does help me and the channel when you do that, guys. If you'd like to know when the next lesson in my Network Plus series comes out, maybe also consider subscribing. All right, folks, thank you very much for supporting the channel and sponsoring the channel. If you'd like to do so as well, you can find out information in the video description down below. Here is a list of all the people making PayPal donations. Well, the ones that said they wanted to be listed. And then, folks, here is a list of some of my Patreons. It's actually way, way, way more than this, but most Patreons prefer to stay anonymous. So if you become a Patreon on my page, on one of the paid tiers, then I'm normally going to contact you and ask you if you would like to be displayed on this list. So if you would like to be displayed on this list, please go check out my Patreon and then just check your DMs after you become a Patreon because normally I'm going to ask you then if you want to be on the list. Unfortunately, most people prefer to stay anonymous. All right, folks, and then for those of you that don't know yet, the channel does have a Discord server. The link is in the video description down below. It's literally at the very, very bottom of the video description. If you go check it out there, there is a link to the channel's Discord server where you'll find myself, other IT trainers, and many other students that's also studying for this course. So if you want to maybe go and study in a study group for Network Plus, or maybe you want to help people, or you need some help, that is the place to go and do it. All right, folks, I will see you in the next lesson of Network Plus.